only time that really frightened me during the war was the U-boat peril. This is what Winston Churchill said in 1940 when the Germans were sinking ships faster than the Brits and the Canadians and the other members of the empire could build them. The U-boat war was the most arduous and prolonged naval battle in all of military history, stretching from 1939 to the very end of 1945, till May. This is that story today. Here is what Germany's goal was, to blockade Britain and to starve it out, to starve it into surrender. The means, the U-boat wolf packs and German naval surface fleet and its air forces. 5,000 Allied ships were sunk by the Germans, 3,000 of them by their U-boats. When World War II began, on September 1st, 1939, here is U-boat 47, commanded by Gunther Brenz, and his target was the British fleet. On October 13th, 1939, the U-47 successfully penetrated the British naval home fleet base at Scapa Flow, as you see in the map, is at the top of the British Islands. And there it attacked the fleet. It torpedoed this battleship, the Royal Oak, and it sank in 13 minutes. 833 British sailors died. It then badly damaged a seaplane carrier. And as a result of this, Gunther was named the Bull of Scapa Flow by Adolf Hitler. Unfortunately for him, the Bull died in 1941 when his U-boat 47 was sunk. So now here is a map of the epic battleground, New York to Liverpool, 2,872 terror-filled nautical miles. However, the German Navy in 1939 was underprepared. Hitler had promised the Admiral of the German Navy that he would not start the war until 1943. So even though the British were afraid of the U-boats, and even though they didn't have many of them, in fact, they only had 21 boats ready for sea duty when the war started. Now, here is a graphic of the most common U-boat, the Type 7. Its range was 9,000 miles, and the Germans built almost 700 of them. Now here, I'm sorry you can't see that too well, the screen is too small, but these are all the other U-boats. The Type 4 had a larger range, and by 1945, the Type 21 would be a radical and revolutionary boat. In fact, it was so revolutionary, the U.S. would copy it after we captured them and turn them into nuclear submarines. More about that later. All right, what was this battleground like? Well, convoys crossing took nine to 10 days, and the speed was the slowest boat. And in those days, how many Canadians are here? Raise your hands. Without Canada, the Brits would have starved because it was the Canadian boats, the Canadian Navy, that helped the Brits to fight the convoys. And, the great, and Britain owes a great deal to its Canadian allies. Slow start for using convoys that were guided and protected by destroyers. Why? Remember, Hitler had just conquered France. The Brits were deathly afraid that they would cross the channel. So where was the Navy? It was in the English Channel. It was preparing to fight off that invasion. So these convoys were severely damaged at the beginning of the war. In 19, between 1939 and 45, as I said, 5,000 Allied ships were sunk. This included over 2,800 merchant ships, 175 warships. This is 14 million tons of shipping. 2,000 ships were also sunk by German aircraft, mines, and shore batteries. 
Now here are a few interesting details. Well, first, as I said, there were too few Allied escorts to protect these convoys at the beginning of the war. Most U-boats attacked at night. They were not true submersibles. And their early magnetic torpedoes, just like the ones the U.S. Navy had, were often very unreliable. It was only later with acoustic homing torpedoes that were effective. If you want to see what it was really like, get the movie The Cruel Sea. Watch The Cruel Sea and get it on YouTube. And the book, both of them will give you a very, very accurate view of how dangerous and brutal this war was. Now, during the early days, Roosevelt helped the British through a lend -lease program. These are pictures of our World War I destroyers that were lent to the Brits so that they would have enough escorts for their convoys. However, these were out of service and the Brits had to spend a lot of time to get them up to speed and arm them and get the engines running again. So it was not an automatic success for the British. In return, we've got 99-year leases in the Virgin Islands, the British Virgin Islands. Now, this is a composite map of all the combined shipping routes that we're going to be looking at today. Some are in the North Atlantic, some in the South, and we're also going to look at the Murmansk convoys for Russia. After the fall of France, the Germans, take a look at this map now. Look at all these bases that the Germans built along the coast of France. And of course, off this map, higher up, would be Norway, and they built a lot of submarine bases there. So now they had multiple ways in which to deploy their U-boats. They didn't have to go from Germany through the Baltic. Well, how did a German submarine attack? Well, here is one of uh, a famous captain, Herbert Werner, the U-557. And he was one of the few U-boat captains to survive. Most died. His book, highly recommend to you men and some women that are interested, Iron Coffins. You can get it. Here are his words describing these attacks. First, he cites a convoy. He wrote as the alarm shrieked, they all jumped down the hatch, the U-557 cut into the waves, and 20 seconds later they were submerged. Periscope deck, he demanded. They climbed up to the designated elevation. Next, we heard the sharp metallic ping-ping of the Aztec that the destroyer sent out to track us down. It was a new sensation for most of us on board. The high-pitched sound struck the boat like a hammer hitting a tuning fork when it traveled through the hull. And then the captain, he turned as soon as quickly on his axis and called at least 30 of them he saw through the periscope, rocking like elephants. We waited till nightfall, 45 minutes away, and then we attacked in the dark. Surface, and then rose at the stern of the convoy. Blow all tanks. 557 broke the surface. In the spray, the howling wind swept into our faces. The night was moonless and black, perfect for our attack. The boat lay low, her deck perfectly awash. U-557 gained speed and surged after their targets. We had the convoy dead ahead and gradually closed the wolf was in the middle of their flock. It was a stunning situation, sailing undetected amid this giant armada of enemy ships, selecting at leisure which one would die. Right, 70, distance, 500, speed, 11 knots. The periscope motor hummed continually. I maneuvered into attack position, held the boat steady, reduced her speed, then wrapped out the final order. Correct distance, 800. Angle, left 30. Twos, three and four, ready. 
fire. The first explosion came from starboard. Another on port and another. A new flash and the saving, the savage slab of detonations rocked the air. Red and yellow flames, lava, molten steel were hurled into the air. We heard the hollow boom of collapsing bulkheads and the piercing shriek of falling masks. Hell reached the Conlax. Our faces glowed in the glare of this wildfire. Huge chunks of steel and debris splashed in the water around our submarine. We hid behind the superstructure and waited until the steel rain stopped. It was the vessel's last agonizing motion. She went down in less than a minute. A few burning planks were all that remained of three of Britain's cargo ships. I continuously scanned the seas ahead and I sh saw a shocking sight to port a thousand meters away. A destroyer was coming down on us fast, its bow racing like a white mustache through the waves. Two other escorts followed a short distance. I screamed, alarm! The cries cut through the night. Go down to 595 feet fast, down into the cellar fast. Then came a terrific explosion. A giant force lifted the boat, shook it violently, and slammed us down on the floor plates of the ship. The depth charges forced the boat down to 950 feet. I ordered rig for silent running, which meant all ev and have evasive maneuvers. So all the motors and instruments that were not needed were shut off. We floated away noiselessly. As the destroyer passed over, more splashes, three deafening explosions astern. The air hissed, but we remained watertight. U-557 slowly floated away. The wolf will live for another day. As I stated earlier, here's Hitler with his sailors and admirals. He had promised that he would wait to 1943, but then he went to war too early. And as he said, he was a man for the ground. He had a yacht, and at the beginning of the season for sailing, he would lead in his yacht the German fleet into the Baltic. He would get violently seasick he was not, he was a landsman. But it was also a goal to construct a large surface fleet, not just U-boats. During the Second World War, the Germans and before, this is what they built. Four major battleships, six pocket battleships, which were heavy cruisers, 21 light cruisers, two aircraft carriers, only one of which was finished. 45 destroyers, 34 torpedo boats, 130 minesweepers, and mine layers. Besides, they built 1,154 submarines. A mighty fleet. Now, Raider wanted a large surface fleet to engage and sink the Allied convoys, and he also would use U boats. Here is one of the pocket battleships, such as the Graf Spey. The Graf Spey had, was 16,000 tons, almost the speed of 30 knots, six 11-inch guns, eight 6-inch guns, armor belt two to three inches thick, range 10,200 miles. This was a surface raider that was successful at the early stages of the war, ultimately had to be scuttled in the River Platte in South America because the, the British Navy caught it there and damaged it, so they scuttled it. Only one of these six battleships would survive the war and would be used at the Bikini testing ground on the hydrogen bomb with other captured enemy warships to see what would happen to them. There were also 10 merchant ships disguised as merchant raiders, which meant that this ship that looked like a typical merchant ship was loaded with guns that would be deployed and force 
the Allied ships to surrender, take on the crew, sink the ship. Later, those crews would be let off in a neutral port. And they were quite effective. And then there are the battleships, the Bismarck, 50,000 tons, 823 feet long. That's a city block in Chicago. 118 feet a beam, could go 30 knots, 10,000 mile range for cruising, 2,200 men, eight 15 inch guns, these are huge guns, 12 5.9 inch guns, 16 4 point inch guns, 13 inch armor plating. The Trippet, Gretschnau, Shorthurst, these were the battleships. Next year, one of my five programs will be Sink the Bismarck, the epic story of what happened to this ship. Now let's compare to the prize ship of the British Navy, the HMS Hood. 47,000 tons, 860 feet, etc., etc. However, its armor was 6 to 12 inch thick, and the deck was only 3 to 7.5 inch thick. This would doom this ship to its utter destruction in its battle against the Bismarck, which will, you ought to come next year and find out why. And then there is the Graf Zeppelin, the aircraft carrier that the Germans built. They actually built two. This one got further into completed destruction, uh, uh, construction. It was launched in 1940. A second carrier actually was laid down in 1938. And it never was completed, and they had drawings for a third aircraft carrier. This carrier was huge. 22,000 tons, 90 anti-aircraft guns. It would have 44 aircraft, 32 four, uh, fighters and 12 dive, dive bombers. 32 knots speed, 861 feet long, 118 feet beam, 4,300 miles range. Never was deployed because Goring wouldn't give them the aircraft that they needed for the, this ship. Now, let's go into fantasy land for a minute. You've seen, heard about the ME-216 jet fighter. What if, and they had that fighter ready in 1941, and then Hitler wanted a fighter bomber, so they had to redesign it, and it wasn't deployed to the end of 44. Now we'll put the Bismarck at sea with an aircraft carrier and jet fighters in 1941. Think about that for a moment. Chilling, isn't it? This was truly a mighty ship, and with other German heavy cruisers, and with this air element over the Bismarck, uh, things may have worked out differently in the North Atlantic. The Germans also had nautical air attack. Here is the Condor bomber. Hitler had one of these, personally made just for himself, he was so afraid of flying that he had a seat that if they were attacked, it would jettison him like a rocket out of the plane with a parachute. Range, 2,700 miles, 2,200 uh, airspeed, four engines, five machine guns. It carried 2,000 pound bomb load. And it had the first surface to air guided missile that it successfully used against us in Salerno when we invaded Italy. They also planned a larger bomber than this to bomb New York. But it couldn't get back. They'd have to parachute and be picked up by a submarine. But there were problems with this bomber. As you can see, it had a very weak undercarriage and airframe. Also, the undercarriage connections for the fuel line were under the plane, so that meant it very prone to any aircraft fire. Now another very important issue for the U-boats and for aircraft was weather. The Germans wanted a Spitzbergen weather station. Now Spitzbergen, as you see on this map, if you uh, look carefully here, there's Norway, this is to the north. 
Uh, in 1941, it was occupied by the Allies. In 1943, the Germans attacked and occupied it. There were German weather stations operating on Spitzbergen to the very end of the war. There were also German weather stations in Greenland. 1942, there were four German weather stations so that the U-boats and their air would have that information. However, by October of 44, the last German weather station was destroyed by the Allies. Think about my program on Normandy. Many of you were here. If the Germans had had that information, they would have known that the weather was going to clear on October 6th and they would have been better prepared for that invasion, but they didn't have this station, so they didn't have that information. Early in 1941, Admiral Perry Noble was appointed as the new commander of the Western Convoy Approaches. He greatly revamped and reorganized the convoy escorts and training methods and procedures. This slide shows the very difficult and dangerous air routes in, uh, I'm sorry, naval routes in the North Atlantic. And here is the air gap, as you can see. This is where the U-boats had a field day. They are also around Ireland, because the Irish would not allow the Brits to have air bases, so the Germans had a field day sinking ships coming into Liverpool, coming around Ireland. Also, uh, the um, what can I say, the, let's go back. Also too, at the end of the war, Ireland was the only country to send condolences to the German government upon the death of Adolf Hitler. The Prime Minister of Ireland actually sent that message to the Germans, which is unbelievable. Now, the gap. So this shows the slaughter of, on the seas that occurred in the North Atlantic. Here were organized the German very effective wolf packs, killer groups that attacked Allied convoys. How effective were they? Well, take a look at the chart. From September 39 to March of 41 was what they call by the Germans the happy time. For the U-boat sinking of merchant ships reached almost an all-time high. There were too few escorts, no air cover, and here is where the Canadian escorts and merchant ships took it on the chin. Many Canadians died, many. This map also shows the slaughter of Allied shipping and the Germans then sinking more ships at a greater rate than could be replaced by Allied shipyards. By September of 1941, the U-boat peril reached the same level as it had in 1917 during the First World War, where the British were very afraid that Britain would starve to death and they'd have to surrender. If this continued, the Germans would win the war. In the fall of 19, in the fall of 1940, 310,000 tons of Allied merchant ships were sunk. Only four in only four weeks by U-boats. In January of 1943, however, Donitz was replaced by this Admiral, Rader, who had been in command of the U-boats. Why did that happen? Before that, what happened to the Bismarck? It was sunk. And Hitler said, the surface fleet is not going to help us win the war. Donitz convinced him to build more U-boats. Unfortunately for, or fortunately for us, and unfortunately for the Germans, this really did not start until 1943, when, he, when Hitler increased production of U-boats. This proved to be the fatal flaw in their naval strategy. There is one of the uh, bases. Here are U-boats under construction in Germany. Now, from 1940 onward, the German Navy had a great advantage with these bases for U-boats along the coast of France. Here, here are these reinforced bases. They were housed in concrete and steel underground boat sheds that covered their piers. They were impervious to Allied bombing. 
And if you go to France today, you can tour some of these U-boat bases. They still exist. Now, when the United States entered the war in 1941 and 42, before we established coastal convoys, because again, of course, we thought the greater threat was where? In the Pacific, because the people on the Pacific coast thought the Japanese would invade the Pacific. 137 ships, 828,000 tons were sunk along the U.S. coast. This map shows you that carnage you can see here in red, right here, all along this coast. Now here's a man you don't know about. On January 14, 1941, U-123 Captain Reinhard Hardigan was at the entrance to New York City. The lower bay looked out, and this thrilled him. Here's what he saw. This is what he wrote in his diary. I cannot describe the feeling with words. It was unbelievably beautiful and great. I would give a kingdom away for this moment. I was the first German in this war to look upon the illuminated coast of the USA in New York. He sank a British oil tanker that night off of Long Island. He survived the war. He died at age 105. In the spring of 1941, U-boats sank 142 merchant ships totaling over 815,000 tons. Between 40 and 41, 700 of our merchant ships went down. January to June of 1942, you can see 585 ships, half a million tons. Only six U-boats were lost. Only six. All of 42, another 5.4 million tons were lost. However, the Germans only had one-third of their U-boat fleet deployed at any one moment. Why? Well, a third were en route, to or from, a third were in the bases, and a third were deployed, sinking ships. Donitz needed more U-boats, and if he had had them, he'd have won. And remember something, not only does the army travel on the stomach, the army travels on the shipping that the merchant marine can bring the supplies to deploy it. And without that, the war would have been lost in Europe. In 1944, the U-505 was captured by the United States Navy intact. It was the first enemy ship captured at sea by the United States Navy since 1815. 59 Germans survived. Here is the U-505 in Chicago, housed intact and refurbished, and now in the interior display at the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. I'm selling tickets today if you want to go. <laughs> they used to have it outside where you could go through the whole boat, but it was exposed to the inclement weather. They brought it inside, cleaned it up, and they have a beautiful uh, display. Here's the arrival of 1954 on the Chicago River by Michigan Avenue Bridge in downtown Chicago. Today at that location, uh, the Architectural Foundation of Chicago will take you on a beautiful river cruise where you will see all the tremendous architecture built along the river of Chicago, old and new. If you come to Chicago, please take that tour. You will love it. And I get a 10% commission. <laughs> here is the UO505 pictured here intact in the museum with a torpedo as part of their extensive exhibition. Three pressure compartments are divided into seven watertight rooms. The door pressure limit was 398 feet below sea level. Among these six rooms, here's what you'll see. First, the forward torpedo room. The control room. The crew box. They never were cold. They were perfectly heated because they had to share them. People going off duty immediately came in and they got back on duty, etc. So it rotated all the time. The engine room. 
diesel engines and the electric engines supplied by battery. The radio room. And here, of course, is the privilege of rank, the spacious captain's cabin. The U-boat was in perpetual motion, humidity intolerable, moisture on everything, food turned rotten, bread mildew, clothes were clammy because they never dried. This was why they were called pig boats because they smelled. Today I talked to someone that served on one of our submarines and he said to me, when you got off of one of those, you just took all your clothes and threw them away. Here is the U-boat medal the Germans gave to these men. See the movie Das Boot. If you haven't seen it, watch it. It will give you a good understanding of the hell these men went through and the hell they created in the North Atlantic and elsewhere. So how did the Allies win this U-boat war? There were five major reasons why we won the war. Number one, in 1942 to 45, here is Admiral, whoops, let's go back. Here is Admiral Horton. He was appointed the new CNC of Western Approaches. He introduced further tactical changes, better training, which we'll talk about in a moment for the escorts, and a whole array of new technologies to help them beat the U-boat. Number two, Captain Frederick Walker, he developed an innovation, attack killer groups attacking the submarines. So he had destroyers that went out and fought the wolf packs and destroyed them. Now, here is the brain center of the North Atlantic. Derby House in Liverpool, England. This is where the over 1,200 convoys during that war were all tracked. Pictured here, though, is the real heroes, the naval wrens of the British Navy. Here they are calculating U-boat movements on the floor of the basement of Derby House. What are they doing? Well, they developed a war game to train over 2,600 British naval officers on new tactics. Well, these men would arrive to play this game of birds and wolves. What can these women teach us? they play and the women would whip their right, right off the ground. They defeated them. And then they trained them. Over 6,000 commanders ultimately spent six days in this training course of how now to better deploy against the U-boats. Fourth, the fourth way is the Enigma machine. What was the Enigma? Well, there were two of them. There was one for the Army, and the Germans had one for the Navy. And these were issued how the U-boats got their orders and how they were deployed. The Allies captured several of these intact. And before the capture, they just guessed as to where the U-boats were. They really didn't know. The Germans broke, the, Ger the Allies, the British, broke the German code. They called it ULTRA. Very few people knew about this. And this is where they were able to decode the German messages. The code breakers were at Benchley Park, UK. And using early computers, they broke those codes. And if the Germans changed the codes, and they would, they had to scurry to re-establish their ability to decode them. Enigma and the Imitation Game, two great movies that show you what went on. And if you go to England today, you can tour Benchley Park and see how they did it. Here is one of the first computers used to break the code. And that ain't IBM. That was Brit. Now, Abel Parnassus, who is the head of German intelligence, he was a naval admiral, but he suspected that the Enigma machine's code had been broken. But no one would listen to him. The Germans thought this is unbreakable. Later, later he was part of the 1944 assassination attempt to kill Hitler, and he was executed shortly before the end of the war. Fifth reason, the Allies introduced all these new 
offensive weapons to destroy. First, the Hedgehog. These were spigot mortar fired by escorts. Second, the B-24 Liberator bombers. They were equipped with lay lights. These were aircraft anti-submarine searchlights that illuminated the U-boats at night on the surface. And of course, these planes had bombs that destroyed them, the U-boats. Hoptoff, another defensive device. High frequency radio detection systems that track the U-boats. And new advanced radars that were more effective. And then the birth of escort carriers. That escort carrier started its life as a freighter. They took off the top and put a flight deck on it. They carried fewer planes, but they could be used to shadow convoys. Because with a plane in the air, the U-boats were hard pressed because they had to come up to periscope depth, they could be seen submerged. But they also had the Navy blimps. Now a blimp is a large gas bag filled with helium. The control car, as you see, is underneath. Here's the control car. That's a gas bag. And they were deployed with them, and they could remain up indefinitely. These first carriers were used in the North Atlantic, and then they were used in the Pacific when we attacked these islands. Many of these carriers were effective in bombing the islands against the Japanese. And at the Battle of Leyte Gulf, it were these escort carriers that saved us from a huge defeat. Those of you that heard that program uh, a year or two ago uh, will remember that incident. So the blitz would cruise at about 750 feet. They had radar, they had 50 caliber machine guns, they had bombs, and these airships were with the convoys. 10 airship bases along the Atlantic coast, or five along the Atlantic, two in the Gulf, three in the Pacific. One blimp was shot down by a U-boat, and we deployed hundreds of these. It will also interest you, and some of you may remember, that Goodyear had a whole service of these blimps carrying people across the United States during the 1930s at different airports. Here's the, all right, and then the TBM Avenger, the U.S. 10th Fleet. So these were the, uh, the aircraft that were part of the anti-submarine group. They were highly effective in destroying submarines. Now, the seventh reason why we won is we built a huge number of ships. Between 19, December of 1941 and May of 1945, we built 10 battleships, 18 fleet carriers, 110 escort carriers, 45 cruisers, nine light cruisers, 358 destroyers, 504 escorts. And today I interviewed uh, a lady whose father was at Portsmouth and he was part of the group that built 355 submarines. In fact, those, he also worked on building the first atomic submarines at uh, Portsmouth Navy Yard, based on uh, German design initially, we'll, we'll look at it in a minute. But we also built 2,700 Liberty ships. These ships were welded together, and they were built on average of 42 days. And you can tour a Liberty ship in San Diego, it's sitting there. In fact, that Liberty ship sailed to Normandy for the 50th anniversary of D-Day, staffed by Liberty ship crew. They sailed through the Panama Canal to France, toured French ports and British ports and sailed back. And now you can see that ship. But we just built so many ships that Germans could not sink everything that we put up. Here's the rapid construction that ships that uh, tip the scales that help us win the war. The turning point in the Battle of the Atlantic began in April of 1943, as you can see from this slide. 
where U-boat sinking started plummeting. These continued to decline because of increasing U-boat losses, improved Allied training, equipment, more warships, etc. A good example, the Germans in April of 1943 sank 100, I'm sorry, we sank 14 U-boats in April of 43. In May, we sank 41 U-boats. In fact, 40% of all U, the U-boats were lost in 1943 alone. In fact, it got so bad that Don intended to withdraw the U-boats from the, the North Atlantic. Another important fact was the transport of our troops. The Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mary, the SS America, the SS West Point, they could take across an entire division at once. They were high speed. They could travel at 28 knots, faster than the U-boat could target them, and none of them were ever lost on any of these troop ships. Now, the Germans did bring about countermaneuvers. They put more anti-aircraft guns. They put all-around radar. They put a snorkel tube, which gave an air supply to the sub when it was submerged. And they had something called the Fuki, a triple-blade rotor helicopter attached to the deck of the sub that would go above to give them better reconnaissance. Now, here are some interesting stories about U-boats that you've never heard about. In September 1942, the U-156 sank a British passenger line of Laconia off of Africa. The sub then tried to save the people. That's what you see on the deck. And they sent out radio signals to Vichy France African colonies. Vichy was a pro-German government after France fell to come and take these people away. Well, guess what? The Allies intercepted the message. And even though they displayed a Red Cross, used flashing lights, B-24 bombers came and attacked that submarine and killed many of the people. As a result, Donitz ordered no more U-boat attempted rescues. Of the 2,700 people on, uh, that they saved, only 1,100 arrived in the French colonies. There's the uh, Red Cross they had deployed on the ship. Now, the Allied convoys to Russia, to Murmansk, after Germany attacked Russia in June of 1941, Lend-Lease was extended to Russia. Archangel was, and uh, Murmansk, both were used, mainly Archangel, because the Germans got very close to Murmansk to taking it. The weather was absolutely abominable. If some of you take a cruise to northern Norway, I hope it's a great season for you because the weather can be very bad. The German U-boat attacks by air, a good example, March of 1943, a convoy of 40 ships, a third of them were sunk by German U-boats and by air. And also the Germans deployed their surface, they had some of their surface navy, a constant threat to those convoys. Here's the Condor attacking Norway, and the threat of attack by the naval warships was always rampant. Here's a picture of a pilot painting another ship killed on his Condor aircraft. Now here is a very unusual voyage of the 511. The, they left the base in France on May 10th, 1943, and they arrived in Penang, Malaysia on July 16th, 1943. Then the U-boat crossed the South China Sea, and on August 8th, 1943, they arrived in Curb Naval Base, Japan. They delivered this advanced submarine to the Japanese, and then they trained them on how to use it. Here is a picture of the crew. Uh, be, and the, you, you, uh, the, the last was a uh, banquet they had with the Japanese. And here's a picture of the crew they trained. 
They then, they were marooned in Japan for the rest of the war, the Germans, and they operated an Italian submarine to bring cargo to the Japanese bases because we sank the whole merchant marine, so the Japanese were starving. So they used these, these men to deliver supplies. This German crew did not back, get back to Germany until 1947. The German sub that could have won the war is pictured here. This is the Type 21. This was developed but was not deployed until late 44 into 45. The speed on the surface was 15 knots. Underwater, 17 knots. The range, 22,000 miles. 15,000 miles submerged. Depth, 787 feet. It was air conditioned, climate controlled. It was had extremely quiet electric motors that could not be detected by the Allies. After the war, it was closely examined, that technology, and much of it was defective, but we perfected it. Also, the streamlined hull, as you see, was used for our first atomic submarines and much of that technology. The sub also had recycled air, better fruit, uh, uh, crew facilities, showers, freezers for food, five officers and only 52 crew, 18 torpedo tubes. 118 were built, but only one was deployed at the end of the war. So that was quite a miracle for us again, the, the delay of these ships. Another unusual thing was Operation Caesar. Fe February of 1944, the U-864 was sent to Japan, packed with advanced technology for the Japanese, advanced rockets and jet aircraft. December 5th, 1944, they left Penang, Norway. The British submarine venturer knew about it. It laid in wait for the sub. Ultra intelligence told the British that this sub was coming. Off the Norwegian coast, with the help of Norwegian underground, the Allies made contact with that submarine, and the U-864 realized that they were being hunted. But the venturer fired a spread of four torpedoes and sank the U-804. This was the first time in naval history that the submarine sank another submarine while both were submerged. <laughs> the U-977, famous boat, some say it carried Hitler, didn't. Fe uh, now we're May 2nd, 1945. Now Germany surrendered on May 6th and again on May 8th. And they're ordered to go to Southampton and sink shipping. May 5th, they're ordered to surrender. The captain lets off 16 crew that don't want to go, but he decides to sail to Argentina. 66 day cruise. May 10th to July 14th, often submerged. August 17th, he arrives in Argentina and surrenders to the Argentine Navy. Well, now there's also an alternative story. Now we'll go into fantasy land. If we get true enough, in 1938-39, the German Antarctic expedition established New Schwabia. That's what you see here on this map. Here it is, New Schwabia. The myth is that Hitler and Eva escaped to New Schwabia. Hitler and Eva got on the U-977, went to a secret Nazi base in Antarctica, and then we operated Operation Hijack and used atomic bombs to destroy the base and German flying saucer aircraft. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> Hitler's still alive, he's frozen. They're waiting to unfreeze him. What were the final results of the U-boat war? 
Many U-boats surrendered in their German ports. We see that the, the, the prototypes of those submarines, the advanced subs, May of 1945, off Rhode Island, the U-853 was the last subboat sunk by the United States Navy. Allied losses. Terrible. As you see from these numbers. 93% of the U-boats deployed were lost. 93% of the submariners deployed died. The German U-boat service was the riskiest combat unit of all combat units in the Second World War. 60 U-boats were deployed to the Mediterranean by the Germans. None survived. Final conclusions. For both sides, the U-boat war was a very bitter and painful struggle. For almost six years, it became the most prolonged and arduous naval campaign in history. Most importantly, though, we must remember that the Allied victory over the U-boat menace became the most single important factor that underpinned all of the Allied efforts for the final victory in Europe. Thank you.